Welcome to the final web lecture on respiration. In the previous web lecture covering Fick's Law, you were introduced to the anatomical structures that are involved with extracting oxygen from the oxygen-bearing medium, either air or water. In this web lecture, we're going to look at ventilation. Ventilation is the process by which a steady supply of freshly oxygenated air or water is continuously brought in contact with the respiratory surfaces. So let's first think about this in terms of Fick's Law of Diffusion. So the factor that we're going to be dealing with in the case of ventilation is this delta P factor, the difference in partial pressure of the diffusing gas between the two sides of the surface. So you can easily imagine that if the air or water was not moving, if it was just sitting still and stagnant at the diffusion surface, eventually the oxygen concentration is going to be the same on either side. Oxygen will be depleted from the fluid and and then you don't get any more oxygen being transferred. So that's where this idea of ventilation comes in, continuously moving fresh fluid, uh, bringing it into contact with the respiratory surfaces. So the very most simplified version of this is seen in very rapidly swimming fish who use a kind of ventilation that's called RAM ventilation, RAM ventilation, R-A-M. Uh, which simply means swimming along really fast with your mouth open. So this is has a great benefit because it doesn't require any additional muscular effort aside from just the muscular effort involved in swimming, which they would be doing anyway. The problem with this kind of ventilation is that you have to keep swimming in order to breathe. So there are some additional mechanisms for ventilation that we see in gill breathing fish. As we've discussed at some length when we were talking about the origin of jaws, the evolution of the splanchnocranium, the evolution of the musculature around the pharynx, the pattern of water flow, whether it be for filter feeding, suspension feeding, or respiration, is in through the mouth and out through the pharyngeal slits. The one exception in vertebrates is this creature called the lamprey. So you'll recall that the lamprey is one of those jawless vertebrates, possibly the closest relative to the rest of the vertebrates, but possibly the sister taxon to the hagfish. And the reason that lampreys are an exception to this rule is because they spend the majority of their life uh, like this, attached by the mouth to a fish sucking their blood. You can see here two lampreys attached and another little circle here where there was another lamprey attached to this poor fish having its blood sucked. So if you're attached to another organism by the mouth, you can't very well respire at the same time by bringing water in through the mouth and out through the pharyngeal slits. So lampreys are the one gill-breathing fish alive that actually uses tidal ventilation going both in through the pharyngeal slits and then out again through the pharyngeal slits. So tidal ventilation means that the water moves in both directions through the same opening. So it goes in through the pharyngeal slits and back out again through the pharyngeal slits. But in all other fish, the flow of water is unidirectional, one way in through the mouth, out through these pharyngeal slits, so these pharyngeal slits can either be septal, as in the case of sharks. So these uh, interbranchial septa are fleshy flaps that can be closed down to cover the pharyngeal slits when, um, when water is coming in through the mouth. But in bony fish, in the osteichthys, one of the synapomorphies of the osteichthys is this bony covering called the operculum. So Bony fish have aseptal gills. They have a large opercular chamber with the gills just kind of floating loose in there, covered by this bony operculum that can open and close as needed to regulate the water flow in through the mouth and out through the pharyngeal slits. Fish move water over the gills using what's called a two-stroke combined suction pressure pump. So in the first stroke, what happens is that this these Pharyngeal slits are closed, in the case of the shark, by those interbranchial septa, in the case of bony fish, by that operculum. 
So that's closed and then the mouth is opened and the floor of the mouth is it dropped. The pharyngeal uh, muscles such as the levators and cucularis muscle are used to expand the pharynx and so there's an increase in the volume of that uh, buccal and pharyngeal cavity, the mouth cavity and the pharynx, the throat, so that water is sucked into the mouth in the case of sharks, also in through the spiracle, this opening that's a remnant of that first pharyngeal slit. And that increase in volume creates a negative pressure in the mouth and water is drawn in. In the second stroke, this is the pressure pump part of it, the mouth is closed, the pharyngeal slits are opened, and then the mouth is compressed, the pharynx is compressed using those muscles, uh, those constrictor muscles surrounding the pharynx that you saw when you dissected your shark. And that causes the water to be forced under positive pressure out through those pharyngeal slits. So this is a repeating cycle of using suction first, then positive pressure, negative pressure, then positive pressure to move the water constantly in a single direction in through the mouth out through the pharyngeal slits. So now let's turn our attention to the evolution of lungs. It turns out that lungs have a very, very ancient and interesting evolutionary history. So in addition to the operculum, another synapomorphy of the osteichthys is that they control their buoyancy, so their tendency to float or sink using a gas-filled sac called a swim bladder, which they can either add gas to to rise up in the water column or remove gas from to sink lower in the water column. And this is used by pretty much all bony fish, all of the osteichthys. And so you see it here diagrammed. It's a very large organ that takes up a good bit of the the space in the thorax and abdomen. There are a couple of different versions of this. So the ancestral state is for this gas bladder or the swim bladder to have a direct connection to the esophagus. What this means is that the fish can actually go to the surface and take in air through its mouth and then force it into that swim bladder to increase the volume of gas in it, or it can go to the surface and let out a little bit of gas, a little belch or something, and to be able to sink down into the water column. And so we call these physostomous gas bladders. The more derived condition that we see in many teleosts and other fish is what's called a physoclistous swim bladder. And in the physoclistous swim bladder, that connection between the swim bladder and the esophagus has been lost. And so instead, what we see is that the swim bladder becomes surrounded by a dense network of capillaries called the reed mirabal. And the swim bladder actually exchanges gases directly with the blood to increase or decrease the amount of gas in the bladder. So there's no connection at all with the, with the esophagus or with the gut tube in the case of these more derived swim bladders. So as you see on this phylogeny, the swim bladders can be located either dorsally or ventrally. Okay, and we see the distribution associated with this phylogeny. So we see in these groups of actinopterygians or the ray finned fish, the gas bladder is located dorsally, sometimes uh, physostomous, sometimes physoclistous, but dorsally located. In just one group of actinopterygians and all of the sarcopterygians, the gas bladder is located ventrally. So I encourage you to uh, try this as a parsimony activity, mapping the presence of a ventral or a dorsal swim bladder onto the phylogeny to try to figure out what was the ancestral state of the gas bladder. And what you'll find out if you do that is that it's most parsimonious for the lungs to be, the gas bladder to be ventrally located. And when they're ventrally located, we refer to them as lungs rather than a swim bladder. So the bickers in the family Polyptiformes among the Actinopterygians have actually a lung, as do all of the Sarcopterygians. So lungs are actually an ancestral state 
for all of the osteichthys. These dorsal, dorsally located gas bladders are a derived state. And so the ancestral state is for those gas organs, those lungs, to have a connection with the esophagus and to be located ventrally. So lungs are actually a pre-adaptation for life on land. They are not an adaptation for life on land. They were present before vertebrates moved to land, and they happen to be useful in being able to breathe air and become uh, land-living organisms. So let's first take a look at how fish ventilate their lungs. So we'll look at the case of the lungfish. So lungfish and most amphibians use what we call a mixed air buckle pump. So this is in some ways similar to gill ventilation in fish in that it uses a combination of positive and negative pressure to move air in and out of the mouth and the lungs. And so we described the process in fish as being a two-stroke suction and pressure pump. We can think of this as being a four-stroke process. So let's take a look at how this works. So in the first stroke, the first phase, the mouth is open, the glottis, which is this little valve between the mouth or buccal cavity and the lungs, is closed. So air is just drawn into the mouth, which is expanded to increase the volume. Air is brought into the mouth under negative pressure due to the increase in volume. In the second phase, the mouth is still open, but the glottis opens. The lung is compressed using smooth muscles surrounding the lungs. And at this point, the air that's coming from the lungs into the mouth is mixed with the fresh air that has just been brought into the mouth under negative pressure, and excess air is expelled through the mouth. So remember that this is a mixture of fresh and spent air. In the third phase, the mouth closes, and the mouth is compressed. The floor of the mouth is compressed, and that forces the air in the mouth into the lungs under positive pressure. And in the final phase, the glottis is closed again, the mouth is closed and ready for the next cycle. So again, this is called a four-stroke suction and pressure pump mechanism, also known as a mixed air buckle pump. So as we've discussed before, amphibians use their skin for respiration. That's part of the reason that their skin remains very thin and has to be kept moist. And the larval forms, and actually even many adult forms of salamanders, retain the use of gills for gas exchange. But most amphibians also breathe, breathe with lungs, and they use a lung ventilating mechanism very, very similar to the one used in lungfish. So in the case of frogs, they begin with their lungs deflated and their nostrils open. Uh, with uh, their nostrils open, their mouth expands to draw in air. Then the nostrils close and the mouth is compressed, forcing the air into the lungs. Then the mouth expands again to draw the depleted air from the lungs back into the mouth. So at this point, fresh and depleted air has been mixing in the lungs and it's mixed air that is coming back into the mouth. At this point, the nostrils open again and the mouth compresses to force out that mixed, fresh and depleted air from the lungs. So what we see in this case is that there's less mixing of fresh and depleted air than in the lungfish. They're not actually simultaneously bringing depleted air from the lungs and bringing fresh air in through the mouth but there's still a fair amount of mixing of fresh and depleted air in the frog. In both the case of the lungfish and the frog, because they're basically forcing air from their mouth into their lungs by compressing the mouth, the tidal volume, the amount of air that's brought into the lungs with each breath, is essentially limited by the size of their mouth. So I invite you at this point to, to try out breathing like a frog by opening your mouth and filling it with air, and then closing your mouth and just pushing, pushing the air from your mouth down into your lungs and experience how much air you get into your lungs doing that. It's really not very much. So we also see similarities 
between both the ventilating mechanisms in the lungfish and amphibians in the use of combined suction and pressure to bring water or air into the mouth across the respiratory surface. And in the case of fish, out through the pharyngeal slits. In the case of the frog, back out through the mouth. So lungfish and amphibians use two-phase mixed suction and pressure pump mechanism, very similar to gill ventilation in fish. We saw that lung ventilation has tidal flow in and out through the same opening compared to the unidirectional flow in gills. So unidirectional flow has the benefit of never, ever, ever mixing fresh and depleted fluid, which is really important in water because oxygen is just not very soluble in water. There's less oxygen content in water than there is in air. So they need to make sure that every bit of water they use to ventilate their gills is maximally oxygenated. In the case of air breathing, there's lots and lots and lots of oxygen in the air. We can afford to do some mixing of fresh and depleted air and still get all the oxygen that we need. When we get to amniotes, we have a huge innovation in the lung ventilating mechanism. And this is aspiration breathing. So in aspiration breathing, Air is brought in directly into the lungs without having to sort of sit in the mouth first and be pushed down into the lungs under negative pressure, so suction only. And this is done by expansion of the pleural cavity. The pleural cavity is the space around the lungs. And then exhalation is done by elastic recoil of those tissues. So those tissues are stretched. Remember that we said when we talked about muscles that elasticity is that tendency to want to regain the original um, size and shape of the tissue. And so that's what happens usually with exhalation to force the air back out. So air is brought into the lungs under negative pressure only. And this is done in lizards using the intercostal muscles. So the muscles that lie between the ribs. So they go from rib to rib. These are homologous with hypaxial muscles. These are a, sort of a segmented version of the layers of abdominal musculature that we saw um, holding in the internal organs. They're, they continue through the ribs as these intercostal muscles. So what the intercostal muscles do is they tend to pull the ribs out. So you can think of this like a bucket handle being raised and they increase that volume of the thorax and the lungs are attached to the pleural membrane attached to the ribs. And so when the ribs are opened, the lung is also expanded, the volume increases and air is brought in under negative pressure in, directly into the lungs. The trouble with this is that these intercostal muscles are also used to create the lateral movements that they use while they're running. And these are done unilaterally on one side and then the other, but breathing has to be done bilaterally, both sides at the same time to create that increase in volume. Otherwise, you're increasing the volume of one side while decreasing the volume of the other side, and there's no net increase in the volume. So the result of that is that lizards actually cannot run or even walk and breathe at the same time because these muscles do double duty in locomotion and respiration. In crocodilians, we see a different mechanism for expanding that pleural cavity and creating the negative suction pressure used in aspiration breathing. So crocodilians have a unique specialized muscle called the diaphragmaticus muscle. The diaphragmaticus muscle attaches anteriorly to the liver and posteriorly to the pelvic girdle. And when it contracts, it pulls the liver caudally or posteriorly, pulling the lungs along with it and increasing the volume of the lungs. So crocodilians don't have this problem of not being able to walk and breathe at the same time. And then for exhalation, the abdominal muscles contract. They push the liver back anteriorly, again decreasing the volume of that thoracic chamber, compressing the lungs, and causing exhalation.
Turtles also are not able to use this costal mechanism of breathing because they, their ribs are attached to their shells. So they also have evolved a solution using muscles to increase and decrease the volume of that lung chamber. So they use inhalation muscles, including the serratus ventralis, which rotates the pectoral girdle and the abdominal oblique that pulls on a membrane called the posterior limiting membrane and increases the volume of the chamber in which the lungs sit. For exhalation, the pectoralis muscle pulls the pectoral girdle back into place. The transverse abdominis flattens that, that membrane, that posterior limiting me membrane forward, pushing the lung back up into place and forcing the air back out through the mouth. Mammals have also abandoned the costal method of breathing that we see in lizards and also the problems inherent in that with breathing and running by the evolution of the diaphragm muscle. So the diaphragm muscle is a synapomorphy of the mammals. It's unique to mammals and it's a dome-shaped muscle that lies at the very posterior limit of the thoracic chamber. It separates the thoracic from the abdominal chamber. And when it's relaxed, it's in this dome shape, going up, curving up into the chamber. And then when it contracts, it flattens out, and it pulls on the lungs and increases the volumes of the lungs. So when that flattens, it increases that thoracic volume, creating inhalation. So it contracts and flattens, pulling the lungs caudally, and expands the pleural cavity for inhalation. For exhalation, the diaphragm relaxes and resumes that sort of dome shape. The lungs compress mostly in normal relaxed breathing by elastic recoil. The elasticity of the tissues just return to their normal shape, but also if you do a forced exhalation, which I'm sure you've noticed, you can kind of go <sighs> and force an exhalation, that's done by the abdominal muscles contracting and squeezing um, basically your abdominal viscera up into your thoracic cavity to force uh, a, more, a more forceful exhalation. So we've mentioned that one of the problems with this tidal flow that we see in nearly all forms of lung breathing is that there's always some mixing of fresh and spent air within the lungs. And so we call this anatomical dead space, the fact that you can't get all of that air out of the lungs in, ex in exhalation. The air that's left in the lungs at the end of exhalation is known as the anatomical dead space. And there's always some of this mixing of depleted and fresh air anytime you've got tidal flow. And for most Terrestrial vertebrates, this is absolutely fine. There's plenty of oxygen in the air, but there are some vertebrates that have extra high energetic demands and have evolved a different solution that involves one-way flow of air, and those are the birds. So the birds have evolved this elaborate network of air sacs associated with the lungs that not only reduce the weight of these flying animals, but also create a one-way flow of air across the lungs so that the lungs are constantly being infused with fresh, non-depleted air. And they do this with a very specialized breathing cycle. So this is actually a two-cycle process of breathing that we see in birds. So we saw in the previous illustration that there are posterior air sacs and anterior air sacs. So each cycle has an inhale and an exhale. So to see how this works, we're going to follow a single volume of air as it moves through the system. So in the first cycle during inhalation, the air moves from the mouth all the way back into these posterior air sacs. And this is accomplished using the body musculature, expanding these spaces and pulling open these air sacs. In the first exhale, that volume of air is moved from the posterior air sacs to the lung and across the lung. That is the first cycle of inhalation and exhalation. In the second cycle, in the inhale, the air is moved 
from the lung to the anterior air sacs. Simultaneously, a new volume of air is being brought into the posterior air sacs from the mouth. On the second exhale, air from the anterior air sacs is then brought out through the mouth uh, for the final exhalation of that volume of air. So this creates essentially a one-way flow and very, very, very minimal mixing of fresh and spent air. The only place where there's any possibility of mixing is in the trachea between the mouth and the anterior air sacs. So now let's take a look at a little bit more anatomically accurate version of this bird respiratory system. So here we have the trachea, the syrinx, which is basically the voice box uh, where the birds create their songs, and then going back to this posterior air sac. And as you can see, these parabranchs or parabronchi, both equivalent terms, are these sort of arching structures that arch through. And if we look more closely at one of these parabranchs, so here we're seeing a section through one of those parabranchs or parabronchus. They have this elaborated surface, these little chambers called antra, singular antrum, which are connected to this whole network of tiny, tiny little tubes called air capillaries. Looking even more closely, these air capillaries are intermingled with a dense network of blood capillaries, which is where the actual gas exchange takes place, and we call this a respiratory labyrinth. And these air capillaries and blood capillaries are arranged relative to each other in a pattern that we call cross-current flow. So this is somewhat similar to what we saw in counter-current flow in fish gills. So as you can see in this figure from your textbook, the air capillaries are oriented perpendicularly to the blood capillaries. So as the blood is flowing through, it's encountering air that's moving in the opposite direction, but it's picking it up in a perpendicular direction. So while the blood is moving essentially in the opposite direction, these capillaries where exchange is happening, it's happening over a very, very short distance. But what happens is that as it moves through, it becomes a little bit more oxygenated as it encounters the deoxygenated air. The blood coming through in the next is still completely deoxygenated, but is encountering more oxygenated air coming and mixing in with the less oxygenated blood coming from the previous capillary and as it moves through it picks up more and more oxygen until it comes to this last one where it's encountering the very most oxygenated air and increases the total oxygen content in the blood capillary uh, by the time it leaves that contact. So if you look at this graph of oxygen concentration in the blood as it moves through the system, there's a little blip as it encounters the capillary, then it moves on, there's another blip where it gets a little bit more oxygenated and increases in the stepwise fashion as it moves through. So if we compare these three different mechanisms for oxygen exchange, we see in fish gills with the countercurrent exchange is really the most effective transfer of oxygen from the medium. So both the fact that the flow is unidirectional across the gills, in through the mouth, and out through the pharyngeal slits, and also this countercurrent arrangement of the blood vessels with respect to the water flow means that they get maximum extraction of oxygen from that water. And remember that that's really necessary in water because water doesn't contain nearly as much oxygen as air does. Next most efficient system is the one that we see in birds with cross-current flow. Um, so again, we get unidirectional flow of the air through the lungs, very, very little mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated air, and a pretty efficient system of this cross-current flow to pick up as much oxygen from that air as possible. And then the least efficient is this uniform pool tidal ventilation that we see in mammalian lungs and other tetrapod lungs that allows quite a bit of mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated air 
and no particular mechanism for manipulating the relative direction of flow between the air and the blood.